Well, good morning, Concord. So excited to be with you today. Uh, matter of fact, excited to be able to start this series entitled Driven Off This Morning. This will be the very first message in a set of four of them that I really believe is going to help us as a fellowship lean forward as we get prepared for the new church year in August, as well as a time when everybody kind of gets back into their routine. You know, as I was preparing the message for this morning, I started thinking about my wife and I. Uh, we've kind of had, obviously, a unique relationship because when we were first married, I was basically immediately uh, jumping into a full-time ministry role. And so, that, by literally, I mean, like, we came back from our honeymoon, and I started the next week as a student pastor in middle Georgia. Uh, there a couple of years, and then after that, God called me to pastor a church up uh, in Cobb County, and so I, I pastored there for seven years, and we absolutely loved it. But then the Lord put on my heart this desire to uh, go and do some things overseas. And so in order to do that, I had to kind of leave the post where I was pastoring and, and launch out into a new mission, uh, which really was involved in uh, setting up training schools for pastors overseas, uh, as well as preaching anywhere I was invited. So the reason that that was a unique time in our life is because it was a time frame where for the first time in our married life, we actually had to go out and look for a home church. And I know that may not sound strange to you, but it's extremely strange uh, for me, and it was for Krista as well. And uh, I can remember, right, no problem finding a church. They were everywhere, so they're on every single corner. So we kind of laid out our list. Here's where we're going to visit and go and kind of check them out and see if that's the place where we want our family to plant ourselves. And then I went. And uh, Krista and our kids, we all went. And I kind of understand what guests feel like, right? You walk in and you don't know anybody. It's kind of like, who's going to, should I talk to people? Should I wait for them? So anyway, we would go in. And I, I noticed that the majority of the churches we went to were very friendly. They were welcoming. We'd come in, we'd sit down. You know, and it was pretty standard every church we went to. We'd sing some songs, listen to the preaching, then you kind of go home. But we realized uh, during that time, especially uh, myself, uh, that a lot of churches really just didn't seem to have a direction. In other words, you know, I've kind of characterized churches oftentimes as uh, either sitting down, doing absolutely nothing, standing up, but very close to sitting down, right? And then those that are leaning forward, so they're actually headed somewhere, they're seeking to accomplish something greater than themselves. And really, whenever I would go into many of these churches, that was kind of the determining factor between what made a church a good church uh, and a great church. Uh, and the difference is mission, right? A, a mission uh, basically is something that gives a fellowship a direction. It leans them forward. Uh, but I, I would say there are a lot of churches who have mission statements, all right? So they got these little things on the wall that you might even be able to read whenever you walk into the church. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are leaning forward to accomplish something great. Too often in the process of a lot of churches, you just kind of get into the routine, right? So you come and that's what you expect, to sing a few songs, listen to a sermon, shake a few hands, and then go home. But that's not a great church. It doesn't mean it can't be a good church. They can, you know, have fellowship and be growing in the knowledge of the Word. But a great church is one that is driven by a mission. And if you think about mission, mission answers the question, uh, what are you doing? Right? What are you doing? So if you think about Concord, really, we need to have an answer to that question. You know, if somebody were to say, what is Concord doing? Right? We should be able to answer that question with the mission that the Lord has given to us. Uh, for example, I want you to kind of imagine this morning two grown men uh, standing beside Lake Lanier, and they are dressed to the nine, right? They've got their Columbia fishing shirts on, and then as you kind of approach those two individuals, you see that above the, uh, the, uh, the pocket on their shirt is actually embroidered the statement, we live to catch bass. All right, now think about that. We live to catch bass. That would be their mission statement as men. That's what we live for. We live to catch some bass. So you, you know, let's just pretend you do this, okay? You probably wouldn't, but let's pretend that you go and you strike up a conversation because you're curious about what they're going to be doing. You can tell they're about to hit the water. And in the concepts of, you know, having a conversation, they invite you to come and check out their boat. So 
uh, you're kind of excited about this, and uh, you begin to head. And in your mind, you're picturing this, you know, awesome bass tracker with this massive engine and all these fishing poles laid up on the, the top of that particular boat, already ready to be thrown out into the water with their lures on them. And so you kind of go, and that's what you have in mind. But then you approach, uh, I don't know, this pontoon boat. And I'm not saying you can't catch bass in a pontoon boat. I'm just saying that that's probably not what you'd be expecting from guys who say, we live to catch bass. And then you get on the bass, uh, or rather the pontoon boat, and you begin to walk around. You notice on there that there are Yeti coolers all over the place, about 10 of them, right? And so you, you don't see any kind of fishing pole. You don't see any bait, any lures. And you're kind of getting confused now because their mission is, we live to catch bass, but you don't see anything on that pontoon boat that would give you evidence that that's what they actually do. So then you assume, well, they must, there must be something in these Yeti coolers, right? And so you ask, can I look inside a cooler? Yeah, you can check that out. And so you go and you begin to pop the top of the coolers. And inside the cooler, much to your amazement, uh, it is filled up with peanut butter sandwiches and Dr. Pepper. So maybe, you, you know, you open one, you think that can't be the case for all of them. But you go through every single, all 10 filled up peanut butter sandwiches and Dr. Pepper. Now that scene would give you the realization that what they have embroidered above the pocket of their Columbia fishing shirt should not be we live to catch bass. But instead, it really should be we live to eat peanut butter and drink Dr. Pepper, right? That's what they are actually doing. What I'm trying to get you to see here is that sometimes you can declare what your mission is, but if that's not what you're actually doing, then you're not really accomplishing what you set out to accomplish. And sometimes that's what happens with missions in the context of a church. So this morning, you and I have to ask the question, what should the mission of the church actually be? And that's where we're going to find ourselves this morning in the Scripture, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. So you can go ahead and open that in honor of God's Word this morning. Matthew chapter 28, we're going to stand and read together what the head of the church, Jesus, said the church ought to be doing, right? And I love this because, you know, as a pastor and a leader, our goal isn't to come and try to create some mission statement. Uh, we just take our orders from what the Lord said, and we try to lead the church to accomplish what Jesus said the church should be doing. And so he describes it very, very plainly. Matthew 28 beginning in verse 19. So if you're not already standing, stand up in honor of God's Word this morning. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 19 and verse 20 is what we'll see. The Scripture says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." All right, let's bow together. Father, we thank you this morning for your divine word and for the fact that you didn't leave us clueless here as a local church, but you gave us very clear instructions, a mission to accomplish. And we pray, Father, as a fellowship at Concord that we would be driven to accomplish the mission that you have given. And I thank you for how you're going to work through your divine word this morning. And that's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So you go ahead and be seated this morning. Now I want you to think through the mission statement that Jesus gave to the church, that he gave to us. Uh, it begins there, as you can see in verse 19, with the word go. That literally means to proceed. It gives the idea of journeying on. It is a word of action, not in action. All right, so this is actually doing something. All right, so go, and then what are we supposed to be moving out to accomplish? What are we journeying forward to do? Well, he says, go and make disciples. Now, this describes the act of making followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is instructing individuals to invest their lives in following wholeheartedly God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's our mission. Go and make followers of the Lord Jesus. Now, where do we do this? Jesus plainly says, in all nations. Now, very quickly, the Greek word for nations is a word that gives us in our English language the word ethnic. In other words, it's ethnic groups that Jesus has in mind here. Go and make disciples of all ethnic groups. Go and share with them that they need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then um, 
we see here, he says that you are to baptize them. Now, when a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ occurs in a person's life, uh, Jesus says those people need to be baptized. And uh, the word baptism, it means to immerse. It means to submerge or put under the water. All right, that's the idea there behind baptism. And I would say to you this morning that Baptist actually uh, got their name historically because people were making fun of them, right? Because uh, they were saying those people are Anabaptists. It was during that historical time. But they were Anabaptists, which means they were rebaptized. And the reason they were calling them Anabaptists as a term of derision is because in that culture, uh, typically when a person was born, uh, the Catholic Church would actually baptize or christen those kids as infants, and that was considered their baptism. But uh, the people who actually started reading the Bible figured out that there is no such thing as infant baptism in the Scripture. What there is a description of is followers of Jesus being baptized. That's why we call it believer's baptism. And so whenever that began to occur, people started kind of ragging them out, making fun of them, and saying, there goes those Anabaptists, those rebaptizers, and a lot of persecution hit them. But that really is where uh, Baptists like uh, Concord Baptist got their name uh, as a result of basically somebody making fun of somebody else uh, back in the day. But what we have here is that people were to be baptized after they claimed to be followers of Jesus in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, this speaks of a person actually identifying themselves, identifying themselves with God the Father, with God the Son, and with God the Holy Spirit. See, True followers of the Lord Jesus make a public declaration of identity with the Lord. That's what baptism is all about. And those who identify with Jesus are then to be taught to keep on doing what Jesus told them to do. Now, if you think about what Jesus commanded, because again, he says, go and make disciples, baptizing them. And then in verse 20, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. Uh, this speaks of the volume and instruction of Scripture and uh, teaching that the Lord Jesus gave to the disciples. Uh, namely, uh, you should love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you should love your neighbor as yourself, right? So that's namely uh, primarily what the Lord has called us to grow in. So we are learning how to follow Him. We're growing in the knowledge of how to love Him more and how to love others more as well. Now, with all that in mind, I kind of paraphrased the mission uh, using uh, a Greek context. And I want you to listen to kind of the paraphrase of Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20. Uh, we are, and this is what Concord is supposed to be doing. So when I say this, I, I'm trying to share with you, this is the mission, all right? This is, uh, like we shouldn't be, you know, wondering what we're supposed to be doing. This is it, all right? So this is plain out what we're supposed to be doing. We are to journey forward instructing individuals to give their lives to follow Jesus within every ethnic group, allowing them to identify with the Lord through baptism, and then teaching them to love God and to love others. All right, that's what we are called to do. We have shortened the mission of Concord to make disciples everywhere. But we derive that mission directly from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. So make disciples everywhere. And I love the um, second half of verse 20. Probably uh, one of my favorite parts of the great commission that we've looked at this morning. Uh, because Jesus gives this. He says, and behold, all right, or lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, Jesus here gives a unique promise to those who are involved in the mission of making disciples. He says, when you are involved in doing what I have sent you out to do, you can know this, I am going to be with you in a unique fashion. So that's the promise, that Jesus will give his power, his presence to those who are involved in his mission. And that happens in a unique way, man, when a church is really involved in his mission. Now, the flip side of that is true as well. If a church is kind of gathering together, it doesn't matter what they have on the wall, if they're not involved in the genuine mission that Jesus gave, then his presence and his power not promised, all right? They shouldn't expect the Lord to really invade or uh, come upon the premises of that local church if they're not doing what they were called to do. 
Now, it reminds me of Jesus' message to the church at Laodicea. Uh, the church at Laodicea was involved in doing some stuff, all right? So they were involved in ministry, but they were making no genuine impact for the Lord's sake. In fact, uh, the Lord wrote a letter to them and described to them saying uh, that they were neither hot nor cold. And this is pretty interesting because in Laodicea, uh, the people who lived there uh, would have heard the reference hot and cold and thought about water. And that's what most scholars believe Jesus was referring to here. He was using water as a picture. He's saying, you guys are not hot, nor are you cold. And the reason water would have came to mind is because uh, Laodicea actually was known for their hot springs. People would travel miles to come and get in these hot springs, especially if their uh, bodies were aged or they were racked with pain. Some of them would come, get into these hot springs, uh, basically to get relief from their uh, particular malfunction in their body. Now, so they knew what hot water was, but they also knew what cold water was. And, and was so desiring of cold water that the city of Laodicea actually uh, built aqueducts that were coming from another town to pipe in uh, fresh cold water. Because they wanted that, they, they didn't have it. But the crazy thing is that as the water traveled all the way to Laodicea in these aqueducts, they actually uh, did not receive cold water, but lukewarm water. And I don't know if you've ever tasted lukewarm water or lukewarm coffee, but it is no good, right? So you spit that out. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus says, you guys are not hot, nor are you cold. In other words, no one is coming to the fellowship of that church in order to receive healing for their souls. It's not warm there. It's not hot there. And then he says, and nobody's even coming for a refreshing, cool drink of water. It's not cold there. And Jesus says, I I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. I'm about to spit you out. Now, now notice, all right, this church was involved in ministry. They were doing things, all right, so they were meeting weekly, uh, regular things happening on the schedule. Uh, the problem was Jesus wasn't there. Matter of fact, Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you'll open the door, I'll come in. All right? But so we, you can get the imagery, right? So they're gathering to church with Jesus out there knocking on the door, and he's not coming in. And um, man, sad reality is that describes a ton of local churches, all right? A ton of them. They are totally missing out on the Lord's presence because they're not involved in the mission of making disciples as Jesus commanded. So that's the mission. That's what we're seeking to do, all right? So Concord, we are driven to make disciples everywhere. You are a massive part of that mission, all right? We, we, it involves all of us. All of us need to be driven in that particular way that we are leaning forward to seek to encourage people to come into the body of Christ by faith in Jesus and be involved in actually making disciples of others, all right? So that's, that's the call. Now, if your mission is to make disciples, that leads us to ask a second question. And that would be, what does a disciple look like? Uh, crazy, we went and visited a house, uh, Krista and I, this past week. And while we were there, we noticed that uh, some people were putting together puzzles. And I know you put together puzzles before, and they had a stack of them. I actually uh, borrowed this. All right, I didn't steal this, but I borrowed this from their house because I, I, I knew what I was going to be preaching on, right? But uh, inside the house, they had a thousand-piece puzzle of this space shuttle. Now, if you've ever put a puzzle together, man, and, and uh, basically had a thousand pieces, you know, that is a difficult task, right? But then if you think about a puzzle, if you remove the box top and you never saw what the picture was supposed to be, then putting that puzzle together really would be a, uh, a long shot, all right? So the puzzle makers, who are apparently pretty smart, they put a picture. Here's what it's supposed to look like, and then you open it up, and here are all the pieces on the inside, so go for it, all right? Now, whenever you think about the mission, we are called to make disciples everywhere. What does a disciple look like, right? What, what is the, because inside you got all the pieces, but what is the picture? And the picture is pretty plain. The picture is Jesus, all right? And when you think about Jesus, I'm not talking about like a, a painting of Jesus like you may have seen before, but what I'm talking about is his character and his conduct. Uh, a follower of Jesus is somebody who gets in line behind Jesus and seeks to do, to live, to say, to think like the Lord Jesus Christ. That is looking like him. That's the goal. That's what we're called to do. So if you think about the character and conduct of Jesus, what do we discover? Now, many of you know that um, 
There was a time in my life when I sat down with the Gospels and I began to write down every single thing I saw in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, primarily that Jesus said and Jesus did. So I was jotting all these down on a legal sheet. And you can imagine that's a lot of legal sheets. It's a lot of information. So once it was over with, I began to kind of see some commonalities as I was looking at all of these particular statements and actions. And then as I saw the commonalities, I started kind of grouping them together. And I realized there were four major commonalities that showed up out of every single thing that Jesus said and everything that he did. And those commonalities were worship, reach, grow, and serve. And you think about Jesus, right? What did Jesus teach us how to do? Jesus taught us how to worship God the Father. What else did Jesus teach us how to do? He taught us how to reach out to those who were far from the Lord. But he also taught us how to grow. The Bible says that he grew in wisdom and in stature. So there it is. He taught us how to grow as well. And then he also taught us how to serve. And you think about Jesus, you can't get a page in the Gospels without seeing Jesus serving somebody unselfishly, sacrificially, uh, really seeking to add value to their lives. So think about those four uh, qualities of worship, reach, grow, and serve. And then know this. Here's what the Bible promises to you and I who have come into the kingdom of God by faith in Jesus. We now are followers of Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 29, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So, so what is this saying? It's saying that the puzzle pieces uh, inside the church really are you and I, right? We're in there and uh, God has uh, basically all authority of our lives, and he is in the process of putting us together and shaping us and making us look more and more like his son, the Lord Jesus, a person who worships, who reaches, who grows, and well as a person who serves. So I want you to think about those four qualities. All right, let me kind of elevate those for you for a moment. First of all, a disciple is one who worships. Uh, the word worship means to ascribe value to something, right? Uh, you basically are expressing adoration toward the Lord. Worship is experienced when Jesus is valued more than anything else in life. That's what genuine worship is, right? You value the Lord more than anyone, more than any job, more than any sport. Jesus is your primary value in life. That is genuine worship, when you're adoring him and ascribing to him worth. The home and treasury of key Bible words says worship means to encounter God and to praise Him. And we encounter the Lord. How do we encounter Him? We encounter Him through our prayers. We encounter Him through our singing, through our sacrificial giving. We encounter the Lord by surrendering to what His Word actually teaches us to do. So this is a way that we worship. It's encountering Him. Now think about the fact that the disciple is one who reaches. Uh, reaches des describes the, and I want you to listen to this uh, this phrase, because I, I chose this on purpose, but uh, reaching is intentionally engaging those who are outside of the faith, who are far from God. That is intentionally engaging them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what reaching is. And a disciple is one who prays for, longs for, and looks for opportunities to introduce individuals to their Lord. That can happen where you live, where you work, where you school, where you play. That's where you are seeking to actually reach out to those individuals with the gospel. Uh, it, it involves really seeing yourself, and this is a mental shift, but it involves seeing yourself as a missionary. All right? As soon as you came to faith in Jesus, you became a missionary. And now you're supposed to reach out with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, as soon as you got saved, you started a mission trip. And that mission trip goes from the time that you were saved to the time you leave this earth. You're involved in reaching others. The disciple is also one who grows. And growing describes the act of becoming more familiar with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And please listen, right? Uh, growing in your faith uh, doesn't mean that you've accumulated the most knowledge of the Scripture. But what it describes is that you are applying what you have learned from God's Word. You're being led by the Holy Spirit who brings to mind His Word in your life and you're seeking to obey. And you're getting to know the Lord. And you do this, and as you do this, you're growing in your walk with Him. Uh, then a disciple is one who serves. Serving describes the act of using your God-given spiritual gifts to help the body of the Lord Jesus Christ grow. 
And Scripture teaches that all followers of Jesus have this spiritual gift, and you should be exercising that in the body of Christ. And I would say it to you, right here at Concord, you should be serving. Man, you should desire to serve. That should be something in your heart that you want to add value to the body, but you also want to add value to the lives of those who are around you. So let's think about that for a minute, okay? you got worship, reach, grow, and serve. We've often described it as the heart of a disciple around here. Your heart has four chambers. Those four chambers need to be open, right? Because if one closes up, you're, you're, in, a, you're in a worse way. All right, heart attack coming. But this idea is that you would be involved in worshiping, reaching, growing, and serving. Now, I want you to imagine a church for just a moment, all right? Imagine a church that has a mission statement to make disciples everywhere. Think about that, all right? You don't have to imagine too much because that's Concord. That's our mission statement. But I want you to go a step further, and I want you to imagine a church that was filled up with members who were overwhelmingly leaning forward saying, I want to be involved in this mission. I want to participate in this mission of seeking to make disciples. Man, what kind of church would that be? That wouldn't be just a good church. That'd be a great church. And I'm, I don't know about you, man, but I want to be a part of a great local church. Not a good church, not one that's just involved in ritual, getting together and smiling and glad handing each other, but one that's really making an impact in the community in which it was sovereignly planted by Almighty God. Man, a mission-driven church is a great church. Now, that leads me to another question, and probably the final question here this morning, but Whenever you have a mission, all right, and then you've described, okay, we're trying to make disciples. Here's what a disciple looks like. You can kind of see where we're going. So here's the mission. Here's what a disciple looks like. Then you've got to ask, is the ministry of that local church designed to actually produce those who worship, reach, grow, and serve? And so, man, that, that means at Concord, we've got to make sure that the ministry here is actually producing disciples who are making disciples everywhere. And um, that's no easy feat, all right? But, but I want to kind of quickly tell you, we desire at Concord to create a place and an environment for you to encounter the Lord through worship. Uh, that's our intention every single Sunday morning as we gather uh, for corporate worship. Worship, by the way, is a place for you to communicate with the Lord through prayer. It's a place for you to express your adoration to the Lord in song. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to surrender yourself afresh to the Lord's teaching in your life. That's what worship is, is to help you become a person who is intentionally uh, adoring the Lord, being challenged to do so, and getting around other people who are desiring the same thing. And could you imagine what our worship would look like if you didn't come in half-hearted, half-asleep, wondering when the song, when can I sit down again? And, but if you came in and said, I'm going to join other worshipers today, and I'm going to give my very best to Him, man, that would change the complexion of what we've got going on in our times of worship. All right, so that's what we want to do. We try to help you there. And that's just a springboard. You can worship every day of your life. I know that. But this is a springboard. This is an opportunity to help you. We're trying to help you in that. But also to help you reach others, we've created community groups. You've heard us talk about these a ton, right? So our community groups are designed to reach out into the community. And that's what we're trying to lead in this endeavor through the Driven series is really to lead those community groups to be uh, reach-driven so that they're looking at opportunities, trying to figure out strategically how they can influence and impact those with whom they live, where they work, where they uh, school, where they play. That's the goal of reaching, all right? And then we have, uh, in order to help you grow, grow groups. We do those on a semester base, but it gets you deeper into the Word of God, accountable with other people so that you're growing in your faith. And then serve. Man, we love helping people figure out what their spiritual gift is, what their passions are, and then plugging them into the life of the body. That's the goal. That's worshiping, reaching, growing, and serving. Man, the ministry of Concord, by God's grace, is helping people get plugged in to those particular avenues of their life. So, over the next few weeks, right, because we're in this driven series, we're actually going to elevate our community groups. We're going to elevate our reach category in the disciples' heart. We want to make sure, all right, that each community group is actually structured, designed, and leaning towards accomplishing the mission of reaching others with the gospel of Jesus. Now, what's awesome is at Mount Yona, when we first launched Mount Yona, and by the way, why did we launch Mount Yona? Because we are here to make disciples everywhere. And 
up there is everywhere, right? So we want to make sure that we're seeking to do that. That's why we're looking at other places to do it. But whenever we first launched Mount Yona, which I'm excited about what God's doing there, we made it a point, let's begin community groups, right? Because again, we want to see people in community reaching the community. And so as a result of us seeking to launch those, uh, myself and Randy and James uh, Forrester, our campus pastor at Yona, uh, all three of us got together. We created a DVD teaching series that on uh, Sunday evenings, you're gonna, uh, you at Mount Union are going to get a refresher. Uh, you at Concord at Claremont, you're going to get the DVD series to begin with. We've described what the ideal community group uh, looks like, what we desire and hope that you guys will grab hold of and say, we want to go in that direction with other people so that you can help us accomplish the mission. So that's why, very important, if you don't have a community group, get plugged into one. I know at Mount Yona, you guys are all meeting at Truett McConnell, uh, here at Concord at Claremont. All you guys are going to be meeting in different homes on Sunday evening. Don't miss that. If you don't have a place, go to the foyer and figure out a place to get plugged in. You don't want to miss it. Listen, if you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus, you should have innate within you a desire to worship, to reach, to grow, and to serve. And as you follow Jesus, you're going to find that you're going to need help with that. And that's what we are here to do as a body of believers, help one another in our walks with the Lord. And man, I'm looking forward to what God's going to do through these driven uh, message series and also looking forward to what God's going to do as you gather together in homes in the evenings and up at True McConnell. It's just going to be an awesome time. So know that I'm praying for you and looking forward to you doing an awesome, awesome job as we prepare for August. And listen, here's the deal. All right, we don't want to be a church that can all just spout out the mission. What's the mission of the church? Make disciples everywhere. We don't want to just be uh, robots, right? We don't want to just be kind of casting this thing out. This is a way, and, and listen to me, all right? This is how I personally want to live my life. I want to live my life as one who is worshiping, reaching, growing, and serving. I want to live my life seeking to fulfill the mission of making disciples. That's, that's me personally. And man, I, I, I want to see you as well. And, and it's not because all of a sudden I got spiritual and was like, I think I'm going to do. No, it's because I realized this is what Jesus wanted me to do. So if that's the case, and we're all following him, and I want you to do it as well. And you might be here today, and you don't even know the Lord yet. And the Bible says that you're separated from God because of sin. We're all born sinners. We all deserve hell for our sin. But Jesus came over 2,000 years ago. He went to the cross at Calvary. And there on the cross, Jesus died for your sin and mine. He bore the punishment we deserve in his body on the cross. He was buried and raised from the dead. And the scripture says that if you'll turn from your sin and place your trust in Jesus, that you can be forgiven of all your sin. You come into newness of life, right? You enter uh, out of the darkness into the light. You, you, you go from being a person on their way to hell to a person who now is on their way to heaven. A person who didn't know the Lord and now a person who has a relationship with the Lord. Man, I want that for you. If you've not responded to him, you're going to have an opportunity in our invitation in just a moment. We'll stand to our feet and I'm going to invite you to come forward. You tell the pastors here in the front that you want to give your life to Jesus. Man, they'll want to pray for you, help you along on your walk with Christ. Or God may be calling you to join this church body. You're like, man, there's a church with a mission and a, a desire to actually structure that uh, ministry to reflect that, that, that I want to be on that. Well, listen, if that's what God's calling you to do, you come forward. You may be an individual, single, but you feel like this is where God wants you to plug in. You come. You may be a family and you just know and sense this is where the Spirit of God wants you to join up, partner with us to make disciples everywhere. You come this morning as well. But the invitation is always, it is the Lord's. Man, we want to ask God right now together to move in this time. So let's bow our heads together and let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the invitation, not only in Claremont, but also at Mount Yona. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to hearts and you would draw people to yourself. Give them courage this morning to come forward as we seek to fulfill the mission together of making disciples everywhere. We thank you for what you're going to do today. and Give this invitation over to you, and we honor you. You are worthy. You are our king. Father, help us not be a church with a mission statement, but sitting down. Help us to be a church with a mission statement that is leaning us forward to do what you've called us to do. And we'll be quick to give you the praise for it. Now use the invitation for your namesake. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.